King's Guard is now on Patreon. Keep Chuck King out on the streets and join this fantastic list of patrons supporting the King's Guide. Learn more at kingsguidespokane.com. To most people, this lot at the corner of Hamilton and Foothills Drive is probably just another industrial property. Now you guys are from Spokane, are you? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Do you recognize this property here at all? Of course. What is it? <laughs> it looks like every Spokane property. <laughs> we took a quick trip to the Bing Crosby Theater earlier this fall to see if any of the skiers going to the Warren Miller film might know what was produced at this property years ago. Is it about skiing? Yep. Now this is in Spokane. Uh, no. Have you ever seen uh, th that facility there? No. Know the location of that? No, okay. I do not. There's an old barn, a two-story shack, a warehouse and a shop, and an old office building. Now, do you recognize this property at all? No. It's on Hamilton, here in Spokane, okay. about uh, foothills. All right. It's a three-acre complex, used to manufacture uh, a product here in Spokane. So this is the location here in Spokane. Okay. Do you recognize that at all? I do not. The company that operated here, though, and the products they built are familiar to millions of people. Oh my gosh. Is that Super not cool. Spokane? Yeah. Mount Spokane. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, that looks like a chair. I don't know. Is that uh, Mount Spokane? Or... It, it is. is. Yep. I, it's been years since I've been there. I night skied there when I was in high school. Sure. My first ski ticket at Schweitzer was uh, season ticket was uh, was handwritten. So. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, oh my boy. gosh. Do not <laughs> recognize I that. Do not. <laughs> That's a space age looking one there. Yeah, yeah. it definitely is. I'm like, uh, future? <laughs> oh, right, right, yep. Yeah, There's the Vista house. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> they had him closed? Nice. 1958. Wow. Yep. <laughs> There's a solid chance everyone in Spokane in the inland northwest has used or seen something this company built. Wait a minute, is that the, uh, is that the tram company? There you go. That's okay, right. Well yep. I take my car, I think, oh, around yeah. there by it, flashes. It, no, it's uh, Riblet. It's, uh, it's, oh, it's, it's, there you go. It's, wow. It's, it's the, Look at him. It's the yeah. manufacturing where they did um, the Riblet. Oh, yeah. King. Yeah, that's right. This is the former headquarters of the Riblet Tramway Company, whose chairlifts have taken skiers to the tops of mountains all over the country. And you're watching The King's Guide. <laughs> I'm Chuck King, and this is part one of a two-part episode on Byron Riblet and the Riblet Tramway Company. Today, we're exploring the life and home of Riblet Tramway Company founder, Byron Riblet, Spokane's forgotten genius. Most people think of him as a, a tramway guy, especially the ski chair lifts. He was more along the lines of the civil engineering. He platted out most of the city. He did the Spokane Waterworks, uh, the Upriver Dam project. He was involved offhandedly with the Panama Canal. Uh, a multitude of, of uh, entrepreneurial inv adventures that he was on, and, and obviously a lot of it's the tramways, but he did so much more. Riblet Mansion up by Arbor Coast kind of or the kind of Partly. Many people today confuse Byron Riblet with his brother Royal, mainly because of the famous mansion that Royal built, originally called Eagle's Nest. Royal's home and property are now known as Arbor Crest Wine Cellars. In contrast, Byron Riblet built his mansion in a quiet, secluded location on the Little Spokane River, and his story has remained, like his home, quiet and mostly unknown. For today's show, Dan Carpenter will be driving us from the Royal Riblet home here on the bluff to the Byron Riblet property up north. Dan just happens to be Royal Riblet's great-grandson. Need a lift? Hello, Dan. How are you? <laughs> Good. Get on in. All right. Awesome car. Beautiful. Thank you. This is a special day for Dan because he has never seen the Byron Riblet estate. And you're excited to see the property, obviously. Of oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful down there on, that, on the river there. Kind of secluded down in there, still today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. It's one of my bucket list things to find out about my family's history on my dad's side um, and answer some of the questions and see what uh, what things were there then. Right, what, right, sure. What were, and imagine what things were like. Yeah, yeah. So how are you related to Byron and Royal Riblet? My dad's dad married Gretchen who was the first daughter of that second marriage. 
That makes me a great grandson. But Royal was married like seven times, is that right? Seven times. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. It turns out that Dan's grandfather, Frederick Carpenter, and Royal Riblet's daughter, Gretchen Riblet, eloped on March 1st, 1927. When asked about his daughter's wedding, Royal Riblet would only confirm that he knew that it had happened. Royal may have been tight-lipped about his daughter because they were estranged from one another after the death of Gretchen's mother, Royal's second wife. She was Royal Riblet with the house on the cliff over the valley and one of the most prominent people in the Spokane area. And when his second wife dies under curious circumstances in Nelson, British Columbia, she was put out to pasture at an orphanage. So my aunt, Joanne, carried a lot of animosity because of how her mother was treated in her childhood. Her royal, really. Yeah, how, how royal treated her poorly, yes. Yeah, wow. So what orphanage? Was I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think she was moved around. Okay, that's true. Uh, I always wondered if maybe she might have spent some time you know, down below at the Hutton Settlement. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, it was there, you know, so, wow. Scandal followed Royal Riblet through much of his life. In addition to his marriage troubles, he also had a large falling out with his brother, Byron. It appears that uh, Royal was uh, embezzling funds or selling parts or, you know, for tramways during the Depression to make up some cash, I yeah. guess. Yes. A lot of that has been kind of hidden over the years. It I has mean, been. Uh, more has come out recently, but uh, when I was young, I went to school down here at West Valley, and we all thought Royal Riblet invented the tramway. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. the tramways were actually around before that. You know, they had been used in mining in the 1860s and 70s. And Royal got, uh, apparently, around 40% of the business. Oh. So it was a fairly big holder in the company. Oh, yeah. So that's how he ended up getting the uh, the money to build this house, obviously. Yes. Here. But then after the 30s, when him and Byron had the falling out, uh, they apparently never spoke again. Never did. Yeah. It, it was a break of the family, a breakup. Yeah, and that's pretty sad. It seems Royal Riblet may have been quite a character, speaking politely. <laughs> well, my aunt had several names for him. Uh, he was a womanizer. And then after that, she'd say, well, at least he married him. And he was a scoundrel, according to her. That probably was about the, the taking money from the company. And, uh, and a four flusher, you know, uh, renaming or using a name so similar to Riblet Tramway. The term four flusher is not someone who flushes a toilet four times. It comes from the game of poker. Specifically, when someone is one card short of a flush and they bluff on the hand. So a four flusher is a slang term for someone who's bluffing or bragging is close to the real thing, but unsuccessful. When Royal and Byron went their separate ways, Royal started a company named Riblet Airline Tramways and tried to get a piece of the tramway business. And he uh, apparently built one tramway that uh, it didn't really fare too well. Single cable across the Spokane River up to Arbor Crest. Right. Well, I saw it. five passengers could get in the, in the thing. I wonder how safe that was. <laughs> the engine was in the car, so you were breathing exhaust and the heat off the engine. And with five people, you imagine the sag in that cable. It wasn't very comfortable and it wasn't used very much, from, according to my aunt, uh, Joanne. So it wasn't something that uh, people went out every day and got a ride up it, to the top. It was an advertisement. He was promoting himself. At the same time, he was taking away from from his brother Byron. Right. Obviously, Byron lived up on the Little Spokane mm -hmm. that we're heading to. So he would have probably came this way to visit his brother and went down Fruitdale Road. He wouldn't have went up the big steep bank, Exactly. Obviously, yes. Coming from this direction. So we're probably running the same route that he would have uh, drove himself. In Byron Riblet's will, he left a 1951 Chevy Deluxe Fleetwood two-door sedan. When Dan told us he owned a 51 Chevy, we thought just maybe it was his great-granduncle's car. Yeah, isn't that something? Yeah, a two-door <laughs> sedan. So a little bit different model. Yeah. But uh, what a coincidence that is. That is, yes. Yeah.
Up north on the Little Spokane, some of the current residents of the Byron Riblet property are waiting to show us around, including John Meisner and Ken Pfaff. John lives in what's called the Guest House, a small house on the Riblet property that was built for the caretakers. However, Byron Riblet and his family moved to the Guest House when tragedy struck. Byron Riblet's Kirtland Cutter Mansion, known as Riviera, burned to the ground in 1933. Ken Pfaff's home occupies a portion of the original footprint of the Byron Riblet Mansion. Because the legend has it, this guy named Sidney Norman, he was a friend of Byron's, and he told him about the Little Spokane River. He said, hey, you gotta find a spot on the Little Spokane River to buy some property. Ty Brown has been studying Byron Riblet for several years now, and he's familiar with much of the history and some of the legends around Byron's property here on the Little Spokane River. And so, according to the legends, he took his word for it and sight unseen, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, purchased 40 acres on the Little Spokane River. It was dormant for many years, because he was, Byron was out, he was in St. Louis, he was in New York, he was in Europe, he was basically all over the world doing civil engineering projects. And so from 1903 or four until 1910, the land was basically just sat idle. And then when the family moved back to Spokane in 1910, they hired Kirtland Cutter to design the, the mansion that they ended up building out there. And they built the, the mansion, they built a guest house, they built a farmhouse that people would lease out and they farmed. And then the area around their house on the Little Spokane River, that was basically a, a, a place for all their friends to come and socialize. Shortly after Byron bought the property, the Dartford Lumber Mill offered him a sum more than he had paid for it, just to harvest the timber on his land. But Byron set the offer aside and forgot about it. And his remote paradise on the river here kept all its natural beauty. So here we are coming up to, wow. uh, just, I would just pull right over into here. I think, okay. Yeah. And I think it's probably good to shut it off here. I wonder. I'll find out. Hi, Ty. Hey. John, how are you? Hi. Well, good seeing you. Nice to see Hi. you. Check. I'd like to introduce you to Dan Carpenter. So he's the great grandson of Royal Riblet. The Riblet Mansion was built in 1910 and completed in 1911. John is going to take us on a tour of the grounds around the guest house where he currently lives. Well, we can look at the construction and I can show you the original shape. It's been added to a number of times. Oh, yeah. Initially, it was just a simple T-shape, but this sunroom is one of the additions. Sure. So this part is part of the original of okay. the T. Yeah. And this is a, a lower room, um, essentially for a laundry, and then that's the master bedroom. Oh yes. Okay. And see, this is a nice sunroom that was added on. Yes. Wow. I want to show you. It's easier to see the shape of it from up here, or maybe from the road. Yes. This okay. This is pretty good. Yeah. So this here was the main section of the house. The windows you're looking through are into the kitchen. It's very narrow. On the other side of the wall is the main room. And this chimney is a double chimney. Uh, at the bottom of that is a nice large fireplace, which initially was the main heat. Um, it now has a pellet stove in it. So I still use wood just as he did mm. 110 years ago. Mm. Um, and so this section here was also added on, I just like the sunroom was. Yeah. So it's pretty easy to see. And then this way was the T. Pretty small quarters uh, yeah, for a family of, of three. Yes. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you're heating it with wood, that's a pretty good idea Yeah. to make it small. Yes. One of the best things about our visit to the Riblet property was watching Dan's reactions to seeing and experiencing his family's history. <laughs> God, this is something. Byron owned the other side of the river too. Oh yes. All the way over to the road. Oh. So you can see the road, there's cars driving on it. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Yeah, what a beautiful spot. The Little Spokane River attracted a variety of big names from Spokane to build summer homes here. J.P. Graves had his uh, mansion just down the river. Uh, Louis Davenport had his summer home on the river. Uh, Francis H. Cook had a, had a big chunk of property uh, in between those properties, and it was it was a place for the the well-to-do in Spokane to have a summer home, 
and to basically socialize with their friends, and Byron fit right in. Local papers reported that weekend parties held at the Riblet Estate often lasted a full week, and that Byron used his frequent travels around the world to bring home ideas for better and better parties with exotic foods and drink. It was Shangri-La. Yeah, definitely That's what a draw. This is. And what Rib then? Riviera, they refer to it as, well, which mm -hmm. yeah. totally makes sense. Fishing attracted many of Byron's friends to enjoy his home here on the Little Spokane. And he had a fishing cabin built right on the edge of the river. And if you'll notice, there's a little deck built on this. My understanding was that uh, Byron and some of his friends, who also like to tip the whiskey occasionally, I understand, uh, would come out here and sit on the deck and catch king salmon. You know, there's stories in the paper of them having parties over here when there was fishing, and it definitely talked about that. It's just kind of crumbling away as it goes. Mm. But you can tell what it was used for. It's not hard for me to imagine what it must have been like. Oh, yeah. Right right over the water, <laughs> the end of it. But here's a, maybe a better angle so you can you know, see the building. Yes, yeah. Boy, see yeah, how it's, it's definitely sagging, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. <clears throat> Let me open that for you a little bit. There you go. Oh, yeah. Now you see down at the end, there's a door and that thing yeah. in front of the window, that's for cleaning the fish. <laughs> Man, and he had it he made. Of course, because. He had it made. My dad fly fished the Little Spokane River. I don't know if he ever knew, I don't know if my dad, he died in 85, plane crash out of Phelps Field. I don't know even it, it he was 54, and if he ever knew where Byron's house was himself, Ooh. I don't know if he ever knew. I don't. It just looking back to see what was, mm -hmm. what yeah. was then, and what he had set up for himself to be that able to go out. That looks pretty nice. So you could, if it was raining, you could you could put the poles out, yeah. lean them against the thing, come in, sit here, and drink a beer while you're watching your pole. While you're watching something yeah. happen. Yeah. Ah, uh, man, this is just neat looking back into history. Uh, Byron Riblet installed state-of-the-art plumbing and electrical systems both inside and outside his home. So what is this? What do you pump now out of this pump that's here? This, uh, this pumps up and feeds, uh, just kind of does all the fields out there. We used to raise alfalfa. The pump house here still provides water for irrigation, but the large water wheels, as you can see, have been removed from the river. Oh, and one of those weights. Oh, <laughs> heavy. Yeah. They had, I'm sure they craned them off here to oh, set yeah. them off to the side. Wow. And there they sit. And there they yeah. sit. These wheels would be a chore to install today, let alone over a century ago. These sat just in the water, probably uh, just, a, just a, enough to cover the curvature of the blades. These wheels were pushed by water in the river, which generated electricity to power lights throughout the property. We need if they were still in, you know, just they're in the water. Sure. Sadly, when the Byron Riblet Mansion burned down in 1933, the fire department didn't respond. This is because the City of Spokane Safety Commission determined that firefighters who were injured on fires outside the city limits would not be eligible for benefits. So the mansion was a total loss. Holy. Anybody want a drink? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably Byron's. But there are a few remnants around the property, like these marble molding pieces. Ah, yeah. Kurt, Kirtland cutter stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After the, after the fire and just, uh, yeah, just dump them there. Can I take a little piece of this marble? Oh, right there. There you go. For high water. You got a, a paperweight. Yeah. Very cool. A souvenir of your family. Now you can see those moldings. The Byron Riblet property was pretty technologically advanced for the time. Byron even had electric lights on trees along the driveway. And sure, it makes sense because he was an engineer, but he was also a surveyor and with John Strack, platted about half of the city of Spokane. By platting Spokane, Byron brought his extensive ingenuity to the development of our city. So platting in addition basically means the surveyors go out, they determine the the property borders of an area for a neighborhood, a new development. And that'll also include the services that are provided for that area, the sewer, the water, uh, whatever it may be that the infrastructure that's needed for people to live, build houses in those areas or businesses. So he and John Strack, they, they did a lot of this together, they, Riblet and Strack, but they, they were responsible for basically building Spokane as we know it with the different neighborhoods. Now we're heading down to Ken Pfaff's house where the Byron Riblet Mansion once stood. Well, the house was here, though. Yeah. yeah. It was the furthest one. Oh, yeah. 
So anyway, the, the mansion would have been where that house is straight ahead of us. This obviously wasn't here. So since then, the property's been split up into, you know, different lots. Mm -hmm. So this was all, this would have all been part of Riblet. Yeah, it, I see. The home mm -hmm. there and then all the, you know, the gardens going all the way down to the guest house. You, the, there's the guy who can tell you right now. Ken would know. Here's Ken. Hello, Ken. How are you? Doing good. We're making our way down the road. Yeah, I'm good. So we brought Dan Carpenter with us. Dan, hi. hi, Ken. I'm nice Ken. to meet you. So, yeah. Great grandson of Royal Rubin. Right. I saw you at the celebration. That's right. Yeah, yes. That's right. Yeah. 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 You I didn't. Yeah. Good. I didn't talk with you long enough, but I know. Yeah, you, yeah, right. you got you got the spot where the the house was, the mansion. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Riviera. Yeah. I, it was, I think it was partly on this property. I'm I see. Sure. Boy, did he ever have a, a beautiful spot? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. everything. This is a picture of the home. So the porch that was here is this. And so there were four columns uh, that were kind of out here. And this, so this was, the, I think, the center of the home. So, so this is the actual uh, the Rimblet That's Byron? The really? Yeah. Yeah. How'd you come, the, where'd you come, we found that somewhere, huh? Yeah, wow. yeah. It's quite a house. I'll have to have you send me that picture. This gazebo is neat. Yeah. This would be a footbridge across the river here. This, this step there was a bridge that went from this gazebo across the river to uh, another one on the other side. Mm. And uh, I think Ty had a picture of that. Aerial picture, aerial yeah. picture that showed the kind of a little white line that was apparently the bridge there. Right. After being at Arbor Crest today, this wall reminds me of that. Yeah, that's yes. Right. Doesn't yeah. it? I mean, that, that kind of... That was probably shared. That would date back to the time they were they were. Oh, yeah. That, long. Because he built that in the 20s. They were partners. And, uh, so yeah. this yeah. totally is reminiscent oh. of uh, Eagle's Nest. And then... Uh, I've got another, there's a picture of the spokesman, I think, that looks, it's shooting this way, and it shows him, see, you had this, kind of, they had these steps, and there's kind of a rock uh, sidewalk down in here, like this oval shape, and she had a fountain at the end that's kind of a, uh, <laughs> like, the, I think she called it a rose garden or something. Mm. This center, center picture, I'm sure is right here. This oh, is, this sure. Is this it's got that footprint, doesn't it? Yeah, you can see some of the stones still here. Sure. And then they're yeah. sitting there having tea, and there's a little fountain in the back, wow. which is the, the <laughs> hole in the ground. <laughs> so cool. You can just see that happening. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Yeah. The renewed interest in Byron Riblet's history was sparked years ago when Jim McLafresh discovered that Byron and his family's ashes had not been laid to rest. Boxes containing the ashes of Byron, his wife, and his daughter were in storage at Fairmount. It really started, I was reading a book, and the main thing that I was interested in, it was surveyors within the Spokane area. And I got to the Byron story, and the very end, it said that his ashes were still up on the uh, shelf at Fairmont Cemetery. So that set me in motion saying, that is wrong. I want to, you know, and he's a surveyor and I think he should be off the shelf. And I started working on it. Laying the Riblet family to rest required some paperwork from their next of kin. And the Riblets were finally buried just this last summer in a ceremony at Fairmont. When I started this, this endeavor, um, I contacted the, uh, one of the CEO, well actually the CEO of the corporation that owns all of these cemeteries. And I told him what I wanted, what I was trying to do. And he said, you have my full support, whatever you need, that Fairmont will give it to you. A few weeks later, a monument to Byron Riblet was unveiled at his gravesite, organized by the local historic monuments committee. On the next episode of The King's Guide, we'll be continuing our exploration of the life and work of Byron Riblet, focusing more closely on the Riblet Tramway Company itself. Ty Brown and I will be accompanied by the Riblet Tramway Company president, Doug Souter, as we drive to several historic sites in Bob Olson's 1962 Pontiac Grand Prix. We'll even get to go inside the Riblet Tramway Company offices and take a peek at film rolls of tramway installations that have not been seen in over 60 years. Among the reels, we found color footage from 1939 of the Magic Mile, the Riblet Tramway Company's first chairlift and the longest in the world at the time. It caps off a lifetime of wondering where some of my uh, you know, forefathers came from and, and Byron heard stories about and all it was just all, it never grew to anything more than a, he had a mansion on the Little Spokane River and here we are where it was and there's where it sat and the grounds and some of the remnants, foundation work, 
uh, similar to what's up at Royal Riblet's place. And they, I, I feel the personality difference between these two guys too. Uh, Byron's more private, uh, and that's why he got her such a private spot here. Royal was gregarious and flamboyant, and we wanted to show, and he wanted to maybe make more out of what it, what it was in life that he really was. But Byron had it, and he just was comfortable with getting away from the business and having Shangri-La, you know, Riviera. This, hence the name, Riviera. This is me. Yeah. Special thanks to John Meisner and Ken Pfaff for showing us around their historic properties. I'm Chuck King. See you next time on The King's Guide. Now the story of two local history nuts who love making frequent local history programs. One of them helped found the Spokane Valley Heritage Museum, but also worked full time in a local meatpacking facility. I just retired. I'm never coming back. The other is a former publisher of Nostalgia Magazine, and at the start of the pandemic, he became the city's worst Uber Eats driver. Hey, wait. Is this a customer's food? It was. Whoops. Together, they produced The King's Guide, or Chuck King's Guide to Spokane History. In their first season of shows, The King's Guide featured all kinds of stories about local pioneers, engineers, racketeers, mountaineers, and maybe a few jerks and weirdos. Their second season is even more ambitious than the first. Every episode of season two will feature a different classic car, owned and driven by a local collector. You can keep Chuck King out on the streets by supporting The King's Guide on Patreon. Your support is essential for The King's Guide to continue. Learn more at kingsguidespokane.com. It's The King's Guide, or Chuck King's Guide to Spokane History. Knows the one I love, sweet Sue.